Welcome in this new podcast episode. Today I'm talking to Willem Gauss. Welcome, Willem. Hi, Arno. Thank you uh, for having me. I'm looking forward to our talk. And you are based in South Africa? Yes, Johannesburg, South Africa. Right, so you born and raised in South Africa, if I'm yes. right? I, I was born and I was raised in uh, Pretoria, the capital city of South Africa. But uh, about 12, 13 years ago, I moved to Johannesburg and I'm loving it here. It's, it's a very energetic city and something people don't know about Johannesburg. It's the biggest man-made forest in the world. Huh. Amazing when you travel here, how many trees we do have. Huh. So what made you move from Pretoria to Johannesburg? Uh, my girlfriend got pregnant, <laughs> so uh, I became a father. But uh, that doesn't necessarily um, make you move normally, I would say. <laughs> I did. I did. So uh, and I'm glad I did. You know, I said to somebody else, now I need to be in a more high energy environment. But where I am for the work that I do and the impact that I do, I could not have wished to be in, a, in another place. This is the perfect place to be. This is the epicenter of unemployment in the world. I've been, I've been looking, for example, at the website of your um, uh, her school. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. <laughs> um, yeah. The high school. And it is a very wild white environment is that is that a, a, a difference because i'm not very familiar with the differences in south africa but is that a difference too between the two places that you are living so that mm. pretoria is very white yeah. and johannesburg is more a mix no i wouldn't say that okay you know but um it's been 27 years now since uh, we're in this democracy so things have normalized right mm. Right. But if I'm looking at your presentations now, you are heavily involved in um, in the in the mixed um, scene. I see a lot of black entrepreneurs in your presentations as well. For me, it's I'm genderless and I'm raceless wherever I can do the impact. For me, it's about the impact. Right. Whatever your organization wants to focus on, that's fine. And that, that's, I think, what a lot of entrepreneurs don't understand is everybody's dream and vision is almost made up of Lego blocks and everybody plays a little part. Although you might think you're, you're the bee's knees, your business is the cat's pajamas. You're only a little building block in somebody else's bigger dream and they're building block again in mine. So uh, I don't... I, I don't look at gender, I don't look at race. I go, cool, where can I have the impact with this very unique and disruptive way uh, of entrepreneurship and business incubation where I can help and help more people? The way we met was we were both at the um, conference meeting, masterclass, I'm not sure how to pronounce this, how, how, how yeah. to say this, for uh, boosting the SDGs. So the sustainable yes. development goals. That's where we. That's where we met, and that's where um, uh, I found you and connect with you and see yeah. that we could have this conversation. Why was that um, topic? Why is that topic important to you, the SDGs? Well, the SDGs, funny enough, is 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 in alignment with my vision. Like I said before, we, without knowing, you fall into somebody else's vision of what they have. And for me, it saddens me when I look at somebody and they have access to all the knowledge in the world. It's not that we need more entrepreneurial knowledge. That, that's not the shortcoming here. And uh, people are not taking action uh, to take charge of their own economy, their own life and their own future. And if you look at the work that I do now, although I'm heavily involved in, in job creation at this moment in time, the overarching theme of my work is to make entrepreneurship accessible to all. You know, this, it's one thing learning about entrepreneurship, but it's, it's another thing doing entrepreneurship. And, and that's what makes us different is we, we help people become entrepreneurs. And that is very 
it fits in perfectly with the SDGs because we don't have a lot of time. And in the current world environment, if you look at, at constant employment, most job creation programs go like, oh, in the next year or next two years or next five years, we'll create so many jobs. What people don't realize is people are hungry now. If, if my children are hungry and I can't look after my family, how can I wait 12 months or 24 months for a job? And that's why uh, with our disruptive process, we help people to become profitable business owners in five weeks or less. So now we can create jobs in weeks and months instead of years and decades. And, and I think that's why there's a great alignment between my work and the SDGs, because now I can accelerate the, 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 the fall behind that we already have in the SDGs. With my current training capacity, I can do 500 businesses a month. In the next 60 days, I can expand that to 1,000 businesses a month. And that's done by a course, by, by training? How do, how do you do this? Well, here's the interesting thing, Arnold. Um, I learned the business model canvas from Osterwalder himself. Uh, lean startup yes don't read that book go and read running lean by ash Murray. and i learned running lean from ash himself as well so i'm very familiar and uh, and i have faith in those processes because they work well but they're not relevant to the needs of of africa and other developing economies because those are mostly opportunity-based uh, processes and methodologies they, they take a very long time and so I developed the process in Africa for Africa. And it's more targeted towards necessity-driven entities. So I really focus on micro enterprises. And that means five people or less doing, um, let's say, a million euro to, to, to three million euro uh, per annum. Uh, I, as I have read that, it, it's focus is that you don't look at large opportunities in the future, you look at small opportunities or maybe even bigger opportunities, but just selling a product or a service, an existing product or service right now. Absolutely. So it, it's about, you know, we, we speed up the process quite fast. Uh, in our business creator pre-incubator, which is the four-week part of the, the program, there is some people will start and kill three businesses. And you're like, no, no, I, I did that one last Tuesday and Wednesday and that, that just didn't pan out. So I, I'm not doing that anymore, but I'm doing this now. And you're like, excellent. And we celebrate the failure. We tell people, have you ever broken up, stepped out of a relationship, a really bad and toxic relationship? And everybody's like, yes, I have done that. And I ask, have you ever been better off as a result of it? They get my life is amazing. And then I say, well, the same is true for a business. Walking away from a business that doesn't work and doesn't serve you is one of the best things you can do. Just kill it, just start another business. And, and that's the important thing. And I'm, I'm glad you, you, you're hammering on to that one. You know, Africa is rich in resources, but we're poor in resourcefulness. And that's a major problem that we face. It's the people are not resourceful. African people are very resilient. I mean, to, to survive in this continent, you have to have hair on your teeth. But uh, it's about becoming resourceful. And, you know, in the first cohort that we did, um, after eight months, 53% were still trading and profitable, providing jobs for 25 people, those 16 businesses. But over that same period of time, an additional 14 businesses were created. And that's, that is very important. That's the key thing. So when somebody's business failed, they didn't sit and go like, well, now I need to look for a job. They simply started another business. And, you know, starting a business is not difficult. It's, I think it's more difficult to fall out of bed than it is to start a business. And it's easy to do something. But we make it so complex for some reason. What, what, do you have an idea what the reason is why we make it so complex? Let's use it. I found people distrust simplicity. And simplicity doesn't mean it's easy. Usually the most simple things are the most difficult things to do in life. But I've coached on so many of these programs. You now in South Africa, 
billions are being spent on these programs trying to develop new entrepreneurs. And I mean, a very big international bank sent 300 people the other day on a 12 month program for, um, and I think it's about $12,000 a head. I think if they're going to have an 8% success rate, that is very high. You know, so it, it just doesn't get the impact because when you go into these things, there's this recipe. Now you have to do this. Now I have to do this. Now, have, And people get tired. You know, I, I've had coaching sessions where the guy said, you know, I haven't had food since yesterday evening. So do you have something to eat? And then we go and get something to eat before we start the coaching session so that they can focus. Uh, to put it in context, in South Africa, we sit with a 34% unemployment rate in the expanded de definition of that. If you take into account people who have not looked for work for six months and longer, that's 46%. And another interesting fact is if you earn 100 US dollars per month, 100, you are in the top 40% of salary earners in South Africa. If you do $500, you're in the top 10. If you do 1,000 euro, you're a one percenter. So, there's massive inequality here, but there's also a blessing hiding in it. But what people don't understand is you can't keep people in a program forever and it doesn't lead to anything. And most of these programs, although they talk pivot, pivot don't happen. They frown on pivot because now you upset the reporting process because most of these corporates just do it for a freaking checkbox exercise so I can score points. Yeah, well done. Let's do that. So it's, it's under the guise of impact, but it's, it's not designed to impact the people who need it most. And, and that's why I looked at the situation and thought, no, th there must be a better way. There must be a quicker way. And that, that's why with this, this process that we have now in Africa, for Africa, so we, we need to do it quick and rapid and get people on their feet so that they can feed their families. You know, but how can you focus on building a business if your kid says, I'm hungry? People don't understand that. You know, one day I was sitting with a, a business owner. He said, the school called me and said, if I don't pay the, the arrears in the three months of school fees, they're not going to let my child into school tomorrow. Now, how the hell do you focus on your business when you're under that pressure? And it's, it's as if people don't know, come and follow this process. I'm not saying that those processes don't work. Mm -hmm. They do. I mean, I work with some of these incubators and, and they focus on, on the later stage businesses. And then you can go through it and it really works well. But I don't know, my problem with the space is I see we're looking for productive adults small businesses we we need to find productive adults but we don't have a proper child development process in, in place what i mean by that there's no process to develop the micro enterprises that will lead to the small businesses we just oh no no stuff nature you know we will find trees that will immediately bear fruit and it's not working you know what? You're selling yourself a far. You're lying to yourself. You're just spending money. And, and also the system's broken. I, I, I looked at, I was speaking to a, another person um, yesterday, in fact. And he said, no, they, they, uh, he worked for a company and they, they take people in a 12-month process at $3,000 a head. And the output is a business plan. Well, what have you done for that person? Nothing. And all of these processes I've, I've seen has led to learned helplessness. Are you familiar with learned helplessness? The concept of it? No. So in the days when the circuses still had animals, they would get a new baby elephant. And they would take a very thin rope, hit the pen into the, the ground and tie the, the rope to the pen and to the leg of the baby elephant. And the baby elephant would try to escape and it learns it can't snap the rope. But when that elephant is an adult elephant, they still use the same peg and the same rope. 
Why? Because it has learned it's helpless and it can't break that rope. But as an adult, it can. So I sit with people in my cohorts, in my classes, six months longer with our jobs. Now I'm thinking of starting a business. So why haven't you started? No, I don't have a business plan and I don't have funding. Now one thing about our work, you, you can swear my class. I don't really care. You can say the worst words ever, but you're not allowed to, see, to use the F word, okay? You're not allowed to say, I want funding. That, that is blasphemy. And you need to figure it out. If you can't find a way to make that first business make money, you know, you're never going to be able to. And if you have a big idea, and some people do have massive ideas, we help them build another business, make money, feed yourself, look after your family, save money, and then build that business, fund it yourself. And that's the interesting thing. Every time I do that in class and you, you tell people, you know, have you ever thought that you could finance your own and fund your own business? And they go like, oh, what sorcery is this? We have never heard of such a thing. And I'm like, yeah, how do you think I've, I find my ideas. Why do you think I'm, I'm very aware of all the money I lost? And so th th there's, there's a lot of issues in the system. And the way that we're going to fix it is not, I'm not going to sit here and tell you, oh, we need to destroy this and destroy that. No. We need to look at how it fits in together. Like I said, we're looking for productive adults, but we're not developing good children. And that's where I fit in. I'm so high up the value chain, most people don't understand my work. So I found a way to say, I serve the bottom of society's pyramid. Those who need entrepreneurship the most, I make it relevant to them, accessible to them, and applicable and actionable within their context. And that works. I love um, talking to you about this because this is, of course, not something I have realized, but I also believe that not a lot of people in the Western world have realized how how different this um, the basis is, right? So how different the the foundation is. Mm. Now, now this person comes to you and says, um, "I haven't had any food since yesterday morning." Um, mm. And you say, okay, let's get first feed because otherwise you can't food because otherwise you can't focus. Mm. Um, same problem with the guy that's you know has to pay the bill for the school for their children. Otherwise, yes. they can't go to school. That's that's if you are are so obsessed with um, shortcoming in money, um, your brain is so obsessed. I mean, um, it means your IQ actually drops, right? So it's infected by um, the pressure on thinking on how do I feed my family, how do yes. I get them to school, all these basic things. It sounds like if you've, you've read up about that research they did in India, are you aware of that? Um, I've, I'm not sure where the research was, but I've, I've read about the research, yes. Yes, yeah, and it's, it's, the, the lack of cash, the cognitive impact, as I remember, can be as high as 15 IQ points. Yeah. And that is massive. That I is mean, massive, yeah, that's huge. Like my one mentor, um, He's this really devout Hindu, and he said, uh, never be poor. Poverty leads to poor thinking, which to leads to more poverty, which to leads to more poor thinking. And it's just a, a vicious circle, which you can, it's very hard to escape. Yeah. And it rings through. And, and with this, you know, um, to add to your point, I don't know if you've ever worked with somebody who has that glazed look on their eyes, where you, know, you can see it's off, nothing's happening. I, I can help you remove that in 24 to 48 hours. And it, you know, th that, that, that is beautiful when that happens. So how, how, how do you live? How do you, because um, I imagine that a program with you also costs money. And if, how do we start a program with you if they don't have the money to do this, right? So how, how do you good. arrange that? That's good. So my current model is a funding model. And I work with other impact organizations. So they fund and we take people through. I also have people who submit uh, 
grants, uh, grant applications uh, to overseas funders so that we can uh, take people through this program. For me to take 100 people through it, it's about 30,000 US dollars. And I'll take 100 people through it. My aim is to create no less than 25 uh, profitable businesses who sustain the owner. But, um, you know, if I look at our statistics, it's much higher. So uh, it will probably be 30 or 40, maybe 50 businesses. And that's fine. You know, the, it doesn't have a cost impact. The higher the impact I can get, uh, the more effective that is. So, and my short-term target is to create 10,000 micro-enterprises. Short-term. Yeah, and then I'll, see my favorite way of building a business to take some aluminum and a rivet gun and jump down the cliff and build the wings as I fall. So I like to push myself. So once I hit 10,000, I'll, I'll do, I'll add a zero. I'll go for 100,000 and then I'll add a zero until I get really, really nervous. But uh, that's realistic. I mean, I'm, I'm so tired of these 1 million this, 1 million this, 100 million this, 100 million that. No, you're not. You, you, you're literally not thinking of what goes into it. And if you have, you're doing a bot's job. I won't call, I won't name the company's name. International company, and they spent $100,000 the other day training 35,000 people. So your brain is probably doing the same thing now that mine did when I heard it. I went like, excuse me? You're doing what? 35,000 or 35,000 people at $100,000? So basically, just sit behind the computer, click next, next, next on an online course, get certificate, well done, there we go. What impact have you done? Nothing. And, and that's, you know, it's, it's, we need to move towards real impact thinking. I know it's a buzzword. And, and thank you for having interviews with people who strive to have an impact. But I found also it's, to a, an extent, it's become an empty word. It's more of a marketing word than an action word. Well, the people I interview have all small businesses, um, let's say up to 30 people or so. Yeah. And you can, they are, in general, the people I speak are more like um, fanatics, right? Oh. So they more activists, right? So they have found something that they feel is unfair and want to change that through a business. And that's, yes. um, but what, of course, the other side is that you see large corporations, they use the word impact and do a greenwashing, right? So they throw a lot of money in marketing at it and say, we do this great thing. And at the and, and all the things that's behind the curtains, you don't see, which actually have a lot more negative impact than um, people mm. uh, know. No, no. And, and that's the sadness. And it's, it's time that we have this conversation. It is time that we, we ask the hard questions. Who is this designed to benefit? Who's the real beneficiary? You know, if you look at that 12 month program with the business plan as an output, who's the real beneficiary? Not the person standing with that business plan because sure as hell they're gonna know a little bit what's going on in there, because they didn't do it themselves. Somebody else, it's, it's the feeding trough. And it's, we need to understand that it's to the benefit of us all once we uplift and economically empower the poorest of the poor, give them agency, you know, give them control over their future and their economic empowerment as well. Mm -hmm. And it, it's time to have the, the conversation. And that's the only thing. And then that's why I want to thank you for having me, because this is part of the conversation to get people to think, OK, why? Because last Tuesday I was speaking at a, 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 a conference and so many people reached out to me via LinkedIn afterwards and said, you were the only guy who spoke the truth. You were the only person who were prepared to point to the elephants in the room. 
And they're like, thank you very much. And I'm getting a lot of flack for it. And that's also a good thing. Anybody listening to this podcast, if people attack you, try to break you down, say bad things about you, then you're probably doing something right. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. If you look at the SDGs, one of the, I think it is the first goal, I'm not 100% sure, which is um, everybody has a fair pay, right? So, yes. and the fair pay is, um, I think it's $2 a day, it's not right? Enough. No, yes. So what do you think about this goal for giving people at least $2 a day? Or making sure that not giving them, making sure that they have it by earning or by building a company, yeah. whatever means they use. See, from the perspective of the work that I do, nobody's unemployed. You're just paying yourself a crap salary. It is, it is literally the easiest thing to start a business. I can't, I wish people would just understand how easy it is to start a business. And I think we need to move away. Have you ever read the book Dead Aid? No. Great book. Go and read about it. It was written by a very well-educated uh, econ economist. And she's just said, you know what, this is this aid, the trillion of, trillions of dollars is not working. Uh, also, you're familiar with Clayton Christensen's work. Uh, he did the uh, jobs to be done theory, but uh, another book that he did before his death was uh, the prosperity paradox. Why the trillions of dollars of aid into, into developing economies hasn't worked. And he, and he does something interesting there. He says something, he refers to the only things that work in these environments are market creating innovation. And those innovations are targeted at the non-consumer. And that's a key word and that, that ties in with everybody should have a fair pay. Now the standard business model collapses once you add a non-consumer to it. And it's like, no. And most people, when you ask, but are you focusing on non-consumers? They, they just, that it doesn't make sense. And he uses a great example of Henry Ford. Before Henry did the Model T, there were 8,000 cars in the world. And I think it's, um, it's an urban legend that there was a newspaper report that the growth of the car industry is, is hindered by the availability of chauffeurs. Okay. And Henry targeted the non-consumer and then it exploded. Okay. Suddenly you had to have a road network. Suddenly you have to have service stations petrol stations, insurance, panel meters, but then also families could go, hey, we don't have to stay at home for the weekend. We can go places. And then suddenly the tourism industry exploded. Now think of the knock-on effect, economic knock-on effect of what he did there. And that's why I think when people say decent pay, first and foremost, we look at what work can that person do that I even would want to pay him $2 because I'm sure they're not that educated. But we should rather look at, okay, cool. Let's look at the non-consumer. How can we make them into a producer? Not necessarily in a job, but entrepreneur, employment through entrepreneurship. That's a very important thing. And I get a lot of flack for that. Yeah, but Willem, you don't build real entrepreneurs because they simply create another job for them. Well, dude, number one, they have a job. So kindly sit down and shut up. And once you have a person in that thinking mode, then you can go, cool, what's next? But it's, I, I found that this freaking startup industry it, it, it's like going on a first date and this woman tells me her complete morning bathroom routine. Then she shares with me all her crazy quirks. And then she says, shares with me all of the insane people she has in her family. Would you go on a second date? No. 
I would run. And that's what's happening. Oh, you have to have this, you have to have this, 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 this. You didn't think of this. And people go like, no, thank you. No, thank you. Do you have kids? I don't know. I do. Have you ever given too many instructions to your kid? Nagel, you could see the brain go like. <laughs> <laughs> many okay? times, many times. <laughs> and it's not that these people are children. It's just you're giving them too much too early. And I would do the same on certain information as well. And we're not meeting people where they are. We expect them to meet them where we are. And for us to be these nice people, we made a cheaper Rolls Royce. So it works. It doesn't work. You can't build a cheaper Rolls Royce, can you? It's impossible. It doesn't fit in. And so nobody's unemployed. They're just paying themselves a really bad salary. And it's simply making entrepreneurial thinking and the resourcefulness available to them and you can empower them in a matter of days and weeks to become financially sustainable. And you talked about before <clears throat> that people start like two, three businesses in 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 the program of four weeks. Yes. Is it about failing fast? Oh God, fa failing fast is, is not does not even apply. It's lightning fast. Why people do that, number one, is not necessarily about failing. It's also because it's so quick, because we have to build a business in four weeks. The, the total program is five weeks, but the pre-incubator is four weeks because you have to do it so quickly. You have little or no sunk cost in that business. Nothing, nothing to hold you back. Oh, but I've committed three months of my life to this. And it's all like this. You're like, no, I used committed eight hours. How did that go? No, it didn't go well. So let's start something else. And that's my, what makes it so easy. It's not necessarily failure, but also maybe it's not the opportunity for you. Because I don't know in, in the work that you've done, but one thing I've found is that the bulk of small business owners build the completely wrong business. A business that would never sustain themselves. Never, ever. It's like saying we're gonna drive up a mountain pass and I, I take a Fiat 500. It's not gonna work. That's why, we're, that's why this business is called the human entrepreneur. We start with the human. If the business can't serve you, you can't serve the customer, and then the customer can't serve the business. See, typical startup thinking is you have the business owner, a finite resource. On top of that, you have the business and then the customer, and it, the demands just go bigger, and it's this inverted pyramid, and eventually you crash. We flip it around and go like, you're standing on top of all of this. Instead of you being a building block in your business, the business comes a building block in your success. That's why I encourage polygamy in business. Have multiple business. You can have as many as you want. There is no law against that polygamy. <laughs> Your other business also interests me. What I found for the courses you do there is the venture designers, right? Mm. <clears throat> yes. Um, and you have a, a couple of interesting courses there about decision-making. Yes. Um, one of them is, um, for example, was, let's see, um, a decision-making as a team, right? As a, as a, um, uh, with remote teams. Tell yes. me a bit more about this decision-making. It's an hour and a half process that we take them through. And it's a rapid way to, to expand quickly and then get back to, to a workable options, not workable solution, workable options. Because from there you can go and unpack how will, will that go about. Uh, I'll share the information with you because I understand you need to do <laughs> some decision making around that. 
Uh, but venture design is, is very much around designed around conversations. We approach innovation from a different con context. We always ask people, you know, of the conversations within your business, how many of those conversations are productive? And people would go, oh, maybe 20%. Okay, cool. What if we can increase the productivity of those conversations? Because those conversations lead to the thinking, leads to the decision making. And um, that, that's what we do with venture designers. Although we do the typical innovation processes and stuff, we have developed a, a, a few things that take only a mere few hours with which you can rapidly help a company innovate stuff. And now I'll gladly share some of our canvases with you that you can go and play with. Innovation is based on decision making. Hmm. And conversations. Right. Yes. Uh, yeah, so conversations is the basis for the decision making and decision making yes. is the basis for innovation. Yes. Okay. How about how do you deal with um, like biases in these conversations, for example, the um, expert bias or the champion bias, um, or the confirmation bias, right? If you oh, have like a group, so many of them. Yeah. Yeah, but if you have a group, there's always the chance that somebody who has a lot of voice mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. starts um, expressing their vision or um, idea, and the rest just kind of like follows. I'm, I'm in glad their path. you're touching onto this point. Number one, always have these sessions facilitated always have it facilitated. Don't think, oh, I read this book, I got this canvas, let's do it. Have it facilitated. Um, but one thing that we always do is you do it alone. So we'll give people post-it notes and then we get to this first process, what are your ideas? And you write it down yourself. And then when everybody's done, we go, okay, stick it up on the, uh, on the wall. And then nobody goes like, oh, but that's a bad idea. Nothing like that. And then obviously we, we group similar ideas together and then we go again. And then one, one great, great tool that you can use then is dot voting. You give everybody a certain amount of dots. Obviously you have a, a master decider, but they have to motivate why, because they might understand the context of where this fits in differently. So the dot voting I found is, is really nice. And especially if you do that using tools like Mural. Hmm. You know, I, I love Mural. It's, it's a beautiful tool that you can do. And uh, great for running design sprints and, and stuff like that. But also, you know, so it's about understanding the room and having a clear process and, and sharing with people, but also creating a safe space. I don't think all trainers and facilitators necessarily understand the concept of a safe space. And you have to create that safe space. And it's uh, not something that we can unpack in a few minutes. It's, it's something that you have to go and read up, study and apply and do your best to do that. So, so you have um, human entrepreneur, for example, you have um, these venture designers at least two businesses. Um, how many businesses did you kill? Let me tell you where, where everything started with the human entrepreneur. It's two stories in one. So the day before the first initial lockdown of the pandemic of 2020, uh, my son and I moved out of the house. So um, I got custody of my son. Only 4% of fathers get that in South Africa. And I lost all my business because of the lockdowns and everything. I had one client left and he paid me before we moved. So I could pay for the move. And that was not, but I didn't have money for the end of the month. Just fresh out of divorce. I'm in debt. I, I have to start over during a lockdown. And then in 2014, when I did the dissertation for my master's degree, 
I focused on the application of innovation methods within existing businesses. And I found that innovation is mostly a farce. You know, it's, it's, people try to innovate a business like this glass, but it's, it's an empty container. It just holds something. And the thing that it holds are people. People make the business, not the business. People make the business. And if you, if you don't innovate the people, if the people don't think innovatively, then the business is not innovative. And you can't innovate nothing. Now, being a personal development junkie, I went like, okay, cool. How do you innovate a human being? And that's when I developed the process. And in 2015, I started developing that and teaching that to people. And one of the first guys I thought he had a, a, a typical IT guy, one solopreneur, and he grew his, his revenues by $100,000 in 10 months. And that's decent. That's, that's a chunk of change. And many other people have had similar results. And I apply that same thinking in my business coaching. And then I looked at that group. I have this process. Let me apply it myself. And I had a two-year recovery plan to be out of debt and have at least five months of overheads cash in the bank. That lockdown started March. That October, I overshot my two-year plan. And I applied what I teach the unemployed youth of South Africa. So it's not that I go like, well, I read in a book, and if you do this, I love what I teach. I'm proof of that. And um, so that's, that's the business that I have there. I'm also a professional speaker. I'm, I'm one of a handful of people who can do the, the Inside Risk Leadership Program. Um, I used to fly around the world and work with CEOs on that. Love doing that. Uh, I miss being on stage. It's one of my favorite things. But um, we'll see. Um, we might start, we're, we're testing different flavors of this uh, job creation program that I have now. We're testing it in a commercial environment next month to create entrepreneurs. If, mm. if we can achieve these results with unemployed youth with little or no resources, what can we achieve with people in corporates who have an abundance of resources that they can leverage on? What can we achieve in that environment? So I'm very eager to see that. We're also going to test it in um, to re reduce recidivism. So if people come out of jail, people don't employ people who come out of jail. Then they turn to crime for an income and then they're back in jail. So now with this, I have an organization that will give four weeks of accommodation. I'll get that person to build a business with profits. They can sustain themselves. And also it facilitates the reintegration back into their family. So now they don't have to go to the family. Do you have money? It's kind of like I come and I can be a productive part of the family again. So we're, we're looking at various different applications and see how we can expand. Like I said, the work that I do is to make entrepreneurship accessible, not just teach it, but make it truly accessible. It, 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 it sounds like you haven't killed any business yet. You're just keeping all options open. And one time when CEO's program is coming back, you will just start doing that again or just uh, go on stage and do that again. Because mm. the, you, you're doing so many things um, now, and, but of course it has to do with limitations with the, with, um, the lockdown, as, uh, partially because there's no speaking um, ventures going on at the moment. Mm. But how will mm. you decide in the future um, where are you going to give your focus to, your attention to? Because you can't do I'm everything, very, right? I'm very glad you're bringing this up. I'm very glad. You know, in the speaking business, I'm a business owner. In the human entrepreneur, I am an entrepreneur. And I like to define the difference between an entrepreneur and a business owner as follows. A business owner is somebody who builds a business within the context of their direct financial needs. And the growth of that business is usually determined by their growing financial needs. Whereas an entrepreneur builds a business outside of their direct financial needs. And the growth of that business is usually determined and guided by a greater vision or mission. I can honestly t give you an answer what will be my focus. My focus is the human entrepreneur. It, it absolutely is. Uh, I, I like the expression shits and giggles. 
if uh, if I get an opportunity to speak some way on the um, on the uh, leadership stuff, I'll, I'll hop onto it. But what I've done in the short term is um, developing a keynote around the work that I do, because we really need to solve this unemployment crisis. And then I get to speak, tell people about this work that I do. So I, I create the the awareness of the impact that we can create through this amazing tool that I have. Plus, I get to be in stage. So uh, do both. Oh, and I'm a single dad as well. So uh, I have to raise a child. My son's turning 12 tomorrow. All right, it's, it's going to be an interesting day. Yes. It sounds, when you talked about how you get funding for the... Um, people that follow your 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 cores your program um, mm. that you you work with a lot of people how, how do you set up how do you arrange and how important is working together with people for you very much I I, I do very little on my own uh, I'm a big big proponent of co-creation and that's why when I go into a deal, a program with somebody, I always ask myself, am I a service provider or am I a partner? If I'm not a partner, I don't want to work with you. Because service providers, they, they add value, but not to the full potential that they can. I believe a good productive partnership, one plus one can equal five, can equal 10, can equal 100. And luckily, not that I, I just, I, I despise designing systems. Okay, don't let. I, I hate the finer detail; it bores the hell out of me. But I like to look at value chains. I like to look at the big picture, and that's why, when I talk to people, I go look at the whole value chain. You know, when I talk to an incubator, depending on the size where they are, so I can be two or three notches up. The, the feeding trough from you. So I can start developing a wave of entrepreneurs and provide you with a constant stream of growth ready businesses because you're going to run out of those people. So if, if I, have you ever seen pictures of a desert off their drain? I've seen um, films of uh, or documentaries on, on, on heavy rain uh, in, in, in these areas. In, yes. in deserts. And, and then it's just flowers. Yes. Thousands of square kilometers of flowers. And animals. And that's the work that I do. So I'm like the desert rain, and I help germinate those, those seeds. And that, that gives the plants, that brings the flowers, that brings the bees, that brings the insects, which brings the, the birds, which brings the bigger ones, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's, it will energize the whole ecosystem. So it's not that I see myself alone. No, not at all. Only together can we work at this. And that's why I say, Let's look at this tool, how we can start from the ground up, truly germinate the seeds. And because, this, because of this process, it's, it, it's like a continuous desert rain, and it will turn that desert into a raging massive forest in a matter of time, very quickly. But we have to shift our focus from this obsession of small to medium enterprises looking for adults while we don't develop our children. We have to shift our focus to your micro enterprises and it's not a one man business. It's five people or less. You know, it, you do consulting and business coaching. Imagine you had a business coaching and consulting business and you had four people in your business. You, you're making a lot of money. That is a serious business. Yeah. But most people in that situation wouldn't even know, oh, you have a micro business? No, I'm a small business owner. No, dude, you get a micro. And that's fine. But the problem, again, that I find with the systems, if you look at the incubation programs and everything, it's, like I said, we're looking for productive adults. It's only targeted towards productive adults. And then they go, oh, but we need to develop children. And then they do adult education with kids. 
and it doesn't work. It's not relevant. Because there, there's the bulk of the stuff that they teach are irrelevant. I, I have quite a few people, you know, in, in South Africa, it's often that people will be on three or five programs. Why? Because they get stipends on many of them. So eh, why not? Gives me something to do. But a lot of people have commented, you know, what you teach is relevant. What they teach is irrelevant to my situation because I have no money. And what they teach is theory. You teach what needs to be done. And once they go through this, they go like, okay, now what they try to teach me becomes relevant because they try to teach me financial management and projections when I had zero in the bank. Yeah. Yeah. And people don't understand the context of the people on the ground. It, it's tough. It's tough. And it's, it's not just Africa. It's developing countries. I was talking to a person in... Where Pol Pot was, where is that place? Anyway, it was in Asia. And he said the government in, announced a 14-day lockdown. And I think it was two days or three days, and everybody was out in the street trading. Why? Because they didn't have more resources that could last them past 48 or 72 hours. And, it's, it's, and that's why we have to look at the necessity-driven micro-enterprises. And that's why we will really energize the informal sector and that will lead to a massively fast growing formal sector do you believe that everybody could start a business absolutely you can start a business within the confines of your risk profile will everybody stick it out no but it is an option when your kids are hungry it is an option when there's no work. So yes, I believe it, it, it's one of the, to start the business, you go and get a packet of crisps. What do you need to find? A hungry person. I will walk up to you and say, Arno, are you hungry? No. Do you know somebody? No. Cool. Then I walk to the next person and the next person. And that, you just started the business. And that process is no different to selling a freaking Boeing jet. I'm still there. Hey, you have an airline? Yeah. No, you don't. You know somebody? Yeah, cool. Go. Okay. You want to play? <laughs> and it's the same thing. It's the same process. And that's what I tell the students. They always look up to me. Oh, but you have this. And I'm like, we are on exactly the same boat. I'm just on a different part of the journey. So there's no difference between you and me. We're just further down the line. Do you believe, um, I love listening to Seth Godin, um, mm -hmm. for me always has bright ideas. Um, yes. And for example, he talks about, you know, making cogs um, in, in, for, for a corporate world, for a business, people who don't think too much and just make them use the standards so they are not very creative. Of mm. course, it's it's an Anglo-American view. It's not it's not very typical if you're educated on a um, um, on a skill. Uh, but do you believe that entrepreneurship? So teaching people entrepreneurship like you do um, makes them more innovative and probably also better employees. Absolutely. So. Part of this work that I do, uh, the, the, the program consists of two, two parts. The first one is a day and a half training, the entrepreneurial awakening course. And it teaches you about, you know, what business should you build, how, how easy it is to start a business without funding and to do opportunity acceleration. But that's also a very good work readiness program to install that type of thinking within people. Because I'm, I'm glad what you said there, you know, not everybody's creative and that type of stuff. Um, if you're a cocky speaker, don't have me in your audience. You know, the first thing that somebody gets on stage and they say, well, I'm a self-made millionaire. I, I send it back and go make me some coffee then. 
because if, if you're self-made, you do everything yourself. So go make me a cup of coffee then, you pompous prick. Okay. <laughs> and I was shouted from the back and they know it. Okay. And the same here, then he gets some whippersnapper. Oh, everybody over 25 is not creative. And then you get the guy who's 45 in the back and he takes out his Blackberry because he still has one and he tunes out. Creativity is not necessarily your ability to have creative thoughts. It comes from perspective. Okay, Perspective is what you bring to the table. I've had mothers co-create new business ideas with owners of IT companies because they bring a, a mother's perspective. I always tell people, you know, the fact that you have a skill in one area doesn't mean it's not applicable in, in another area. If you're a parent and you ever had two teenagers in the house at the same time, you are a the gold standard in conflict resolution. Okay, you know how to handle flinging piles of poop when, when the shit hits the bat. And that's fine. And, and people don't understand its perspective. You and I might look at the same thing, but we sure as hell don't see the same thing. And it's, it's when you bring that perspective that it, bring, it, it, it becomes interesting. And that's when you, you really lift and, and surface the creativity and innovative thinking within people because they go like, hey, back then I did this and so forth and so forth. And people don't think those, the information and experiences that they have are valuable. People don't value themselves. But with this program, I help them to surface that. I love the thinking of James Altucher, <clears throat> how he talks about um, he's a very big investigator of the 10,000 hour rule. He talks about the many guests mm. about this idea and he always explains the way that he sees it, is that if you have, for example, an experience in one um, place and an experience in another place and you, you, you stack them on top of each other, you, you will be growing much faster. You don't need 10,000 hours to do this. Right. So, totally um, agree with that and thinking, then yes. of course, if you also stack these two, um, experiences or skills, you have something that probably nobody has because there's nobody has the same combination there right so exactly hmm. i always one example i like to use in class i said let's say there are two child daycare center centers for toddlers or babies or you know, what do you, let's go two to five years old okay the one is owned by dads and the other one is owned by mothers it sure as hell not going to be the same type of school Okay, I'm sure the dad's going to be 10 o'clock running with knives, 10.30 playing with fire, uh, 11 o'clock how to put a Band-Aid on properly. And it's, it's not right or wrong. It just is. And that's okay. Imagine you start an HR company. One started by a mother of four children and the other one started by a guy who never wants kids and he just chases success. Neither one is going to be right or wrong, but the two businesses will be completely different. And it's because they bring, she brings a motherly perspective to it. And we need to understand the perspective that people bring, which is so important. Yeah. Well, I think I could go on, on and on with you about no, this, that's fine. this topic. No, I, 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 I love oh, what you do. I've learned a lot um, thank you. by talking with you. And I think I, what the most important thing that I got was um, uh, reality's perspective, right? So um, uh, the, the things that you are looking at with human entrepreneur is, is the reality's perspective. It's because the reality is that people have no money and mm -hmm. The reality is also that you can start a business, right? You can you can use the creativity you have, and and start making a life, right? Become mm. a good person by, um, you know, 
become an entrepreneur or at least um, run companies so that you become a creative. And I love that idea. Thank you very much Thank for you. sharing it. Thank you very much. And I uh, wish you all the best of luck with your podcast and the work that you do. And thank you. Never stop doing this. You, you're helping spread the message and change the world through the work that you do. Thank you. Thank you.